All right, good evening, everyone. Um, I feel a little bit ridiculous holding this microphone with like all 10 of you in the room, but uh, it's actually for our video cameras that are recording. So thanks for obliging us with the microphone. We appreciate it. Thanks for coming out on a Thursday night. It's good to see you all. Uh, my name is Blake Armstrong. I'm a partner at The Family. The Family is an accelerator for startups that's based in Paris. We invest three things in the startups that we work with. Education, unfair advantages, and capital. Um, I can tell you more about our activities, typically, of what we do in Paris, if you're interested afterwards. Um, tonight, we're going to be talking about how to pitch an American VC. Um, and before I get started, I'd love to get to know a little bit more about you. So who here is running a venture, some kind of a technology startup? Anyone? So, you're, or, well, you're, it counts. You've got a startup, so it's, yeah, that's good, yeah. You guys, I chatted with you guys, yeah? Okay, anybody else? Great, okay. So a few people that are working in the tech startup realm, it sounds like. Um, so I want this night, especially since I actually enjoy doing talks that are a little bit smaller like this, so it can be a little bit more interactive. I'd love to get, um, we'll get to a slide in the presentation where I talk about ways to practice your pitch. And I'd love if you could be thinking now about how you would describe your venture in one word. One or up to five words, why not? Because it's kind of tough to distill it into one, into one word. Um, but when we get to that slide, I'd like to pass the microphone around and let you all explain to everyone in the audience a little bit about what you do. So, um, all right, so as far as this talk tonight goes, we're gonna talk about the steps before you uh, start pitching a VC. Um, what you should be doing on the day of when you're actually doing the pitch, when you're walking into the VC's office, um, and then afterwards, how to follow up, right? Um, all right, so you should, first of all, you should have two versions of your pitch deck. You should have one that is um, meant to be delivered verbally, like I'm doing right now, where you're explaining the slides. And you should have one that is meant to be just attached to an email that explains what you're doing um, in a more text-driven way. Tonight, most of the advice that I'm gonna be giving is about a verbal style presentation where, you've, where you're doing something like this, where you have a slideshow and you're explaining every slide. Um, pretty much the only difference with the written one is that you add a little bit more text on the slides. Um, as a general rule, you should try to keep it to three ideas per slide. Try to keep your presentations to 10 to 15 slides max. Definitely don't go over that and no bullet points. You'd be surprised at how much of a difference design makes in the slides. Your goal as a startup when you're pitching a VC is to make the information that you're passing on as easily distilled as possible and as easily transmittable as possible. So the more design work that you put in on the front end, the easier that is for the VC to understand what it is that you're talking about. Um, and that's the end goal of <laughs> your pitch anyway. So. Um, you want to you want to be able to show your ideas clearly. You want to be you want to be presenting with lots of swagger, and you want to be showing your passion as you're talking about your startup, right? Um, so here are the ten elements of a good pitch deck, right? You want to you want to very clearly present the opportunity. Uh, you want to be very clearly present the problem, the solution. Um, the four that I've put in bold and underlined here are the ones that we're going to go into uh, tonight in a little bit more detail in terms of how to present around those ideas. Um, so let's start off with traction. All right, so first of all, um, one thing that often happens with startups that come to us at The Family for Help is that they say, hey, we want to raise money. And we say, well, okay, why do you want to raise money? And they say, some reason. They say, oh, well, if only we had money, then we could do, we could do X, Y, and Z. And usually it's about building a better version of a product, especially if it's tech-driven folks, and they're saying, oh, well, we could kind of finish our algorithm and make it look a lot prettier and nicer. But really, um, the thing that matters most when you're going into pitch to VCs is showing traction, um, especially in Europe. Um, so it's very hard to raise money in Europe just on a deck and an idea. Um, there's a caveat to that if you're a, a successful founder with a track record, it's maybe possible. Um, but most of us here, I think, that's maybe not the case. So. What you really want to be showing is, hey, I've, I'm really proving that there's demand behind this product. There's a market that I've, I've gone out and found, and there's people that really want what it is that I'm building. 
Um, so a, a pattern of fast growing momentum, you want to show what metrics and why, and you want to show a clear sales process. So to be very clear about what I mean here, um, a nice rule of thumb is that you're growing at 7% or more per week for a period of 12 weeks. So you want to show sustained week over week growth over you know, a two to three month period of time. Longer is better. Um, and then VCs can say, oh, OK, I can see that there's actually some people that are interested in the service. And I can see that if I'm investing, then it's going to increase that, that growth curve, right? There we go. So from a VC's perspective, how do, how do VCs evaluate a startup? So VCs are looking at total addressable market. So they're looking at if, if in a best case scenario, if the startup does everything that they say that they do, and they're able to capture a decent percentage of the market that they're attacking, what's the potential upside? So that's what we mean by total addressable market. So if you, if you have a startup idea that's only based on you know, doing peer-to-peer -peer lending in Barcelona or something, and you're saying that's all that we're focusing on is the Barcelona market, we want to be the best player in the Barcelona market, no VC is going to give you money because Barcelona is too small, right? Like even if you capture 100% of the market in Barcelona, it's still not going to be able to, to give the VC the returns that he needs to make, he or she needs to make on their investment to make it worth their while. Because it's risky, right? Investing in startups is inherently risky. Um, so you need to show that your, your market that you're attacking is large and that you have a plan, a step-by-step step staged plan for attacking each step of the market. Um, so as you're talking about your customers, describe clear use cases. So separate out the different types of customers that might be interested in using your product and the different, even assign a name um, to each, like you can say, oh, well, Julie comes home on a Thursday night and she wants to cook dinner with her friends for you guys that are building your cooking app. Um, and then you can come up with another character in your presentation named Sam or something. And you can describe how the use cases differ and how the markets differ. And then you can assign priorities to which market segments you're going to attack first. Um, keep in mind that user growth is great, but the best proof of demand, there's nothing beats revenue. So if you can show that people love your product so much that they're willing to part with their hard-earned euros just to be able to use your product, um, that is the most telling example of demand from a VC's perspective. So keep that in mind. Um, so when you get to your business model slide, this is what you want to be proving, right? You want to be proving consistency in revenue versus cost. You want to be showing that you're financially literate, that you know what you're talking about when it comes to startup financing and, and how to raise money and how to deploy money, how to be, um, how to be lean, and just that you're level-headed. So you don't want to come, this happens a lot where we get startups that come in and show us these growth curves that are oh, five years into the future and we're growing at 50% per year and it, it's just this hockey stick chart which no sophisticated investor is going to be interested in that at all. And if anything, it's just going to make people think that you don't know what you're talking about. So any financial assumptions that you put into your business model, you really need to be able to defend them with, with a reasonable explanation. Um, and if, if you have a reasonable explanation for why you would be growing 50% a year, then great. But um, just be prepared to defend it, I guess. Um, so. Really, at the end of the day, there's only three reasons that are valid from a VC's perspective as to why you should raise money. So test hypotheses, increase growth, or increase profit. So there's lots of things that you can do to get to those goals. So you can hire a developer because you need, not, not because there's like a product thing that you want to do or there's like a pet project on the side that you really want to build that you're excited about. But because maybe by hiring an extra developer, you can create a, an additional set of features that's in demand by your customers, and it's going to increase your adoption rate by your particular customer segment, which will lead to additional profit. These should be the, the driving forces behind any decisions that you're making um, around use of funds. So when a VC asks you, oh, well, why are you raising the funds? You need to be able to draw a clear line between um, one of these things, testing hypothesis. And this is typically more in the, in the seed stage, right? So if you're going out and raising 50 or 100K, it's, it's okay. Like people know that you don't, maybe you've shown a little bit of traction at, at first and you're telling the VC in your pitch, well, we think that we have these three hypotheses and we want to raise just a little bit of money to test these before we, we start raising a Series A round. 
where we're really going to stick more money into um, into driving in on one of those customer segments, um, and that's completely fine. But the other two, for growth and profit, you want to already have the growth curve in place so that you know ex for every dollar or every euro that you're spending, um, it's going to result in an increase in, in growth or an increase in profit, hopefully both. Okay, so as you're building your deck, this is kind of very tactical <laughs> advice here. First, start off by drawing, so draw 10 squares on a piece of paper. Um, you can. All these slides will be available online, so you can go back and see the 10 elements that should be in your pitch deck. And write the, the name of each slide on the top. And start thinking about um, like a tweet size explanation of what you want to say about each one of those slides, about the opportunity, about the problem, about your solution, something that's really short, like 140 characters. Um, and then start expanding that to a full narrative or like a story that you want to tell about your startup for each one of those 10 slides. Um, this, so this is a good way to not get caught up in, um, you, you wanna keep a narrative arc going throughout your entire slideshow and that's very difficult to do if you're building your slideshow from scratch in PowerPoint, let's say. It's a lot easier to do when you start it, start off on a piece of paper. Um, all right, so now getting into pitch stuff. Um, and being able to do an elevator pitch is one of the most important things um, for any entrepreneur. You want to be able to, al you're always closing, right? You're always pitching, you're always closing. Every single person, even in your conversations here tonight, you should always be trying to make your presentation of your startup or your project more concise, more clear, and more adapted to your audience. Um, so a few tactical ways to do this are to use analogy. Um, so a clear example of this, remember when Steve Jobs famously said on um, at the, at the dis disrupt or the conference. He was saying that using Apple or using iTunes on a Windows computer is like giving a glass of ice water to someone in hell, <laughs> um, which is it's really funny. It gives you this great like analogy of, wow, you're in this Windows ecosystem and everything's ugly and not working well, and then you use iTunes and it's like this great experience and you're drinking your glass of water. Um, so try to, try to think of analogies of what, what is your product or solution solving for your customer's needs and build an analogy around that so that it's very clear for the person that you're talking to what it is, what need your problem is solving. Um, as you're communicating about your startup also, you should be talking about customer value, not your product performance. So as you're thinking about the analogy that you can create, don't, don't talk about, you know, oh, well, my, this hard disk that I'm building is, you know, 10,000 RPMs faster than the leading competition. Like, no one cares. Like, that doesn't matter. Like, talk about the fact that your hard disk can you know, let you save information, you know, 10 times faster or something. Um, and it's going to, it's going to, hello. <laughs> and it's going to make people's lives easier because they're going to spend less, less time in front of their computer. That's the element that you really want to be focusing on as you're, as you're creating your elevator pitch. And it's okay to pick a fight, right? It's okay to say that your competition sucks and to tell people very clearly, and maybe this is my American side coming out, it's fine. Um, so it's okay. Tell people that your competition sucks and be very upfront about why your product is better. Um, there's no, no shame in that. Um, so here we go. But This is the slide that I mentioned earlier on. So for those of you that have just kind of come in, if you're working on a startup right now, I'd love for you to, to think about how you would present your startup in between one to five words. So let's say that you're at a coffee shop and there's someone who's very well dressed who looks like they may have some money and may be interested in investing in a startup that you're running. So how would you describe your startup to them in one to five words? Um, anybody want to have a go? Uh, mine would be um, a scooter whenever and wherever you want. Love that. Anybody else? Okay, cool. So these are just a few ways that you can practice your pitch. So what we just did here, this is like the one word exercise. These are all separate ways of practicing. Um, so three acts in a play. This is basically describing your startup through three stages. So first introducing your hero, um, then describing a problem that the hero has, and then how the hero has some kind of a solution. Um, so basically it's, it's saying, you know, oh, there's a problem in this particular market. Um, it's, it's not being solved for this reason. Um, our startup is solving it in this way, and now our, our, our customers' lives are better in these, these ways, X, Y, and Z. So 
this, this is kind of like a three sentence way of, of describing your, your startup. And the idea here is, is that you can have a pitch that's adapted to every situation, right? So you wanna have a pitch that you can give in five seconds. You wanna have a pitch that you can give in 30 seconds. You wanna have a pitch if, you, if someone's giving you, you know, five minutes to chat with them. You wanna have enough information that you've rehearsed in your head that, that clearly explains what your startup is doing. Um, another one that I really like is the Jedi mind trick. <laughs> so um, this is a way where you're, try you're trying to get the person that you're speaking to to ask you a very specific question. So let's say that you need a developer on your team and you know, you know that this person knows a developer that could be a good hire for you. So you can change the way that you present your startup to that person so that that person is then asking you, oh, well, no, oh, that's interesting. I think I may know a developer that could help you out. So this, this is a nice way of making, oh, you know, oh, that's a great idea. Thanks so much for offering to put me in touch with that person that I saw that you know on LinkedIn. <laughs> Not that I'm stalking your profile or anything, but yeah, great. Um, and the last way, which is really important when you get to the, to the stage where you're actually pitching a VC, obviously you need to do a full-blown test run of your presentation as many times as possible, um, both with and without your deck. So obviously it's a lot easier to do a presentation when you have your deck with you because you can be reminded of all the different steps and things that you want to explain. You have visual aids. It can be harder to do a full-blown presentation without your deck, so you should practice doing both on friends and also people that you don't know as well. And usually people are pretty cool. If you send them an email and you say, hey, I'd really love to take 15 minutes of your time, buy you a coffee, would you mind um, if I pitch you my, my startup and you give me your honest feedback? Most, most people will be thrilled to do that, I think. Um, so, as, so the first step in this process, right? Um, I'm assuming that maybe, well, maybe I shouldn't assume. Who here knows someone who works for Kleiner Perkins? Anyone know someone that works for Sequoia Ventures? No? Index Ventures? No? Okay. So I guarantee you that every, one of, every person in this room knows someone who, who works at one of those companies. And since I know people that work at all those companies, you all know someone in this room who works at one of those companies. So um, the goal of, of, of this exercise here is saying, okay, I know that I want to get in touch with persons X, Y, and Z. So I'm going to analyze my social graph, um, and I'm going to figure out which people I know in, in first degree connections know the people that I want to get in touch with, and I'm going to be very strategic about how I reach out to those people. So who here has done, so LinkedIn, a while ago they released a product called InMaps. Did anyone get a chance to do like a social graph using LinkedIn? Yeah? So super cool thing that LinkedIn put out, um, which allows you to, to visualize your uh, your social network and see um, like how far away you are from certain people in your network. Um, incredible stuff. So actually, unfortunately, LinkedIn killed the product. I looked this afternoon and it's not available anymore. But there are other product products out there. If you Google like create your own social graph, that can link into LinkedIn and uh, you can still get the same information. So I recommend that all of you do that. Um, and then you should be strategic about the way that you ask for introductions. So you should say, if, if you have decided that you want to get in touch with persons X, Y, and Z, then you need to come up with like 10 people that all know those people and ask them for introductions separately. Um, it's always good if that same person who works at Kleiner Perkins has three different people in his network that he, he or she knows that have all said good things about you. Um, it certainly doesn't hurt. So um, as you're asking for introductions, you should definitely have like a, a pay it forward type attitude. Um, this is something that certainly exists where I'm from Los Angeles originally and people are doing this in the film industry all the time and people are doing it in the tech industry in San Francisco all the time. Um, where you're, you're putting your network out there for people that you trust, um, knowing that the day that you need them to put you in touch with someone, they're going to do that for you as well. So these, these are very, uh, so you have to be always, always thinking of how you can add value to people in your network. Because you, know, you never know when you're going to need to ask them for an introduction. Okay, so how do you do this? Um, so first of all, you should, you should write an email to the people that you want to get in, to the, to the person that knows the person that you want to get in touch with, right? And you ask them for 
15 minutes of their time so that you can explain your project. You offer them three different times that you would be available to meet them at a location that's very convenient to them. I'm sorry, I'm trying to be as tactical and as practical as I can here. So, um, so, so one, once, you, once you lock down a time to meet, um, they will, I'm sure, be very willing to open their resources and their contact book and put you in touch with that person. And the way you should be immediately reactive, right? If, if they put you in touch with the person that you wanted to get in touch with, you say thank you to the, to the person that put you in touch, and you immediately follow up with the person that they put you in touch with. I know this stuff sounds like kindergarten stuff, but trust me, it's, you'd be surprised how often people don't follow these rules. Um, so if you're doing this to raise funds, especially from a VC, you need to be doing this like times 100, right? So the key thing, there's two key things that you need to do before meeting with VCs. One, build traction for your product so that you're not just sitting there saying, hey, I've got a really good idea. It's going to be the next Facebook. Oh, really? Well, where are the customers, right? Um, but if you, if you have some customer traction behind you, then the customer traction is telling the story and you don't have to. The second thing you need to do is create competition amongst the VCs to get into your startup, right? If you're only talking to one VC and they don't invest in you, you're screwed. If you're talking to 100 VCs, then they're going to, and this is especially true in, in the Valley, VCs talk to each other. They're all friends. So if, if word of a deal is, is going on and people hear that your startup is fundraising, you're going to have a better chance of getting, of getting funded. Um, another key rule of thumb that, that I found is that the people who connect you with more people, so let's say you... Let's say I talk to you and I talk to you and you connect me with one person and you connect me with 10 people. The, the connections that you, you gave to me are, tend to be more valuable, actually. Um, because it means that you took the time to introduce me to 10 people and you thought through very clearly who you wanted to introduce me to. Whereas if someone just says, oh yeah, I met you for a coffee, I guess I'll throw you one introduction. Typically it's not worth the time of, of if you have the choice. You would rather spend time chasing down the 10 people that one person Okay, so during the pitch, it's the day of the pitch, you're walking into your, you know, the, the gilded room of the, of the VC's office in downtown London or whatever it is. Um, so you've got the opening, you've got your pitch, and you've got your close. So what does this look like? Um, first of all, do your research before you come in to, to see the VC. Know what, de you know who the partner is that you're meeting with. You should definitely look up the deals that that partner has done in the past. Read their bio on the website. How did they get? How did they get this job at this VC firm? Um, and use that as a way to build some rapport with the VC at the beginning. At the end of the day, VCs don't just invest in ideas; they invest in people, and that's totally true. Um, and they invest not only in people, but who, whoever made the introduction to that VC also makes a big difference. If they know that it's a, a friend who had funded one of their previous companies who made the introduction. That can make all the difference in whether a VC will decide to fund you or not because there's a level of trust that's been built up and shared with you by the person who made the intro. Um, so show up early. Definitely do not be late. VCs are extremely busy and will not appreciate you not respecting their time, so it's kind of a non-negotiable. Um, the transfer of trust, so again, kind of a kindergarten tactical type thing, but it's important. You get in and, and you want to share a story about the person that put you in touch. So, you know, oh, um, yeah, so it was so great that Dave put us in touch. Oh, yeah, Dave, I remember that one time that he saved a cat from that burning tree. Oh, that's just like Dave, you know. <laughs> so you, whatever it is, you want to create some kind of a story and some kind of rapport around how you know the person that put you in touch. Um, and be sure to script your opening. So you want to think through mentally, you know, even practice this with your friends. What does it look like when you first walk in the door? You're probably sitting in this really nice, you know, mahogany table with like a view over London, with like, you know, plaques on the wall of all the billion dollar companies that the VC has funded. And it's intimidating, right? Like you want to know, okay, what are the actual words that are coming out of my mouth when, when this VC first walks in the room and he shakes my hand and he sits down and he says kind of casually, oh, well, tell me about your startup. <laughs> You, it's not like you're just winging it. Like you need to know literally every word, what's coming out of your mouth, and in what order. Um, okay, so during the pitch, pitch with confidence, and remember that at the end of the day, it's not just about the pitch. It's about building rapport and it's about having a conversation. So most VCs are interested in what they'll sit there silently a lot of the time while you're pitching, um, and then at the end, they just want to have like a, a nice, easy back and forth with you. Um, 
So I, I did this myself at my last startup. We ended up pitching at Google Ventures, at Andreessen Horowitz, at Index, at Greylock, at a lot of the top tier firms in Silicon Valley. And it, it was the same thing every time. They would just kind of sit there very, very calmly looking at you and <laughs> it was like, what are they thinking? But, um, but it would all come out in the conversation afterwards. So don't be surprised if they're not kind of interrupting you throughout the conversation, that's normal. So during the end of your presentation, you, you have to make a concrete ask, right? Like you, you need to be very clear about what it is that you're asking for in terms of money, or is it that you're asking them to join your advisory board, or um, do they, are, are they maybe experts in SaaS and you want them to be on, on your board and you, you want their investment and not their competitor's investment for a specific reason, and you wanna be really clear about this stuff. Um, so when you make the ask, you say, you know, oh, well, can I count you in for a million dollars? And you ask a question, and then you shut up. <laughs> so the worst thing you can do is just kind of do this nervous thing where you just kind of keep on talking and fill in, fill in the answer for the VC. You don't want to do that. You just want to ask the question and then just leave it hanging and then let them kind of fill the room at that point with whatever their thoughts are. Um, so afterward, um, so there is a a process and should be thanking the VC definitely with a handwritten thank you note. Um, in this digital age of ours, people less and less often are sending you know, handwritten things, so that's a really nice way to stand out uh, sometimes. I will say that VCs aren't gonna decide to fund your company because you wrote them a handwritten thank you note because you're a nice guy, but it certainly doesn't hurt. Um, and, and also think about how, how you can add value. So if you do your research well, and let's say you saw that a VC recently made another investment in a SaaS company, for example, and you have a best friend who was just at you know, some top school and graduated with a degree in that and is looking for a new opportunity, you could say, you can present that to the VC and say, hey, how can I help you out? You know, I've got people in my network and resources that I can share that could be useful to you. Um, and the more that you pay it forward like that, the more it tends to work out well um, for the relationship. So this is usually in terms of process, this is what it, what it looks like. If the VC says, hey, this sounds great, I wanna put a million dollars in, there's usually a verbal yes. So they'll say, yeah, I think this sounds good, I'm, we're interested, so let's keep the conversation going. Um, after that, the VC would send you a term sheet, um, which is another whole discussion about all the terms that are on a term sheet and what they all mean. Um, and then the VC would go into due diligence and you should go into due, due diligence because if you've been doing this to 100 different VCs, hopefully you're gonna have a choice of whose money you accept. Um, so not, not all money is good money. <laughs> keep, that, keep that in mind. Um, and then signatures and, and money transfers is kind of a formality that your lawyers and accountants would take care of. Um, show gratitude, add value, we talked about this. So the title of tonight's presentation was How to Pitch an American VC. Um, I hope I'm not seeming pejorative as I bring this stuff up. But it's true that for Americans, some of this stuff is, we have some cultural differences with Europe, even though we're very similar. Um, so one thing I've noticed in my time living in Paris for the last two years is that people in Europe sometimes are a little bit more, there's more of a delay in the email time in terms of like when people will get back to you. Americans, are especially Silicon Valley people, I mean, they're constantly connected. So if they don't hear back from you in like two days, it's like, who is this person? Like, if, if, you, if, you, if they write you an email, you've gotta get back to them like yesterday. So um, keep that in mind. Um, always be on time. Americans are known for this, right? Like we get to places early even. I learned this the hard way, showing up to dinners early in France, right? Like, don't do that. So, um, so in, in the right way to do an email intro, or at least the Silicon Valley way to do an email intro, there's two ways, right? So if you're paying it forward to someone and you're, you're putting them in touch with a VC that you know or putting them in touch with someone that they could potentially hire, there's two ways to do this. One, you can either ask that person um, to write the intro that they want the person to whom you are introing them to see, and then you forward their email with a quick note saying, hey, would you like to be introduced to this person? And you do not put your friend in carbon copy. Um, that, this is typically a technique that you would use for someone who's maybe a little bit more senior, who, who might not want their email address to be shared widely. And by doing it this way, you're respecting them and you're asking, hey, is it okay if I share your contact information with someone with whom I'd like to put you in touch? 
The second way is just to write an email and, and put the person that you're introing in carbon copy and you're writing to the person uh, who the person in carbon copy wants to be introduced to. Um, and you just say, hi, hi Dave, um, you know, Matt really wanted to meet you. Here's Matt's background. Um, Matt, as we discussed, here's Dave's background. Very happy to put the two of you in touch. So one thing I've seen in France is that oftentimes when I ask to be introduced to people, they'll write me an email back and they'll say, oh yeah, um, just tell them that I, I said it was okay that you contacted them. So that's crap. Don't do that. <laughs> and don't, that's ridiculous. <laughs> and anyone that does that to you is not, not being a good friend and not paying it forward to you and that's, that's not helping anyone. So um, say thank you. Like afterwards, the follow-up is really important. Like if someone has just gone out on a limb and introduced you to someone that's important in their network, you have to treat that super respectfully, right? Like after you have the meeting, you need to go back to that person and say, hey, just wanted to thank you again so much for putting me in touch with so-and-so. We had a great meeting, we discussed X, Y, and Z. Thanks again, would love, like if there's ever anything that I can do for you, would love to be of help. Um, and a lot of, you have to close that loop so that people don't feel, because the worst thing that you want is for the person that just made a nice connection for you to say, geez, I don't know, like after, after I made the connection, like did they follow up, I don't know, maybe like that person uh, just completely let it drop in their mailbox. So you wanna reduce that anxiety for people um, and make it easy for them to introduce you to more people. Um, posture and handshake, you know, just yeah, shake people's hands. It's true in America, people do kind of judge you by your handshake sometimes, so just a nice firm grip when you're, when you're meeting people. Um, and smile when you're giving your presentation. Don't, don't just be so focused on the numbers and seem nervous. Like try to, try to make it fun and give, you know, have a good time while you're, while you're meeting people. Um, and no smoking, right? Like especially in California. <laughs> um, so people do not like smoking. They do not like the smell of smoke. And even something that's you know, kind of personal like that, um, no moral judgment here. It's just, it can be very distracting, you might say, for the conversation. So it's just better to not bring it up. Um, okay, so anybody have any questions? So he, so he talks a lot about uh, like getting getting in touch with PCs via by intros, but uh, give, uh, say for example it's your network is not that expensive or whatever, you don't have good connections in whatever in the states, but you do have them in Europe. So um, how do you feel about like uh, approaching PCs uh, cold, cold cold calling PCs either via email or LinkedIn or uh, Um, so you're, you're welcome to try. You would probably be one of the first people in the world that would ever successfully fundraise doing that. Um, so, I mean, you're not going to be blacklisted or anything, but yeah, VCs typically do not work that way. And they'll even say, oftentimes, like if you go to Kleiner Perkins' website, it'll say we don't accept cold emails. And like, if you send us anything in the mail, it'll be put in the trash, basically. And you know, we, we take no legal responsibility for anything that you send us. Um, and that's, this, it's similar to Hollywood actually. Hollywood had the same problem where script writers were sending scripts to Hollywood studios and then if a studio made a film that was similar to the script that was sent to them, the person would sue the studio and say, you stole my idea. Um, so this is America, right? We're very limited, we love lawsuits. So, um, <laughs> so, so that's why typically for the cold stuff that, that doesn't tend to work. So yeah. Um, um, uh, own use case, um, if you get um, contacted by a VC, um, even when you're in a time where you're not fundraising and they asking just for, um, let's say, a random talk, a very general to get in touch, see what you're doing and then yeah, finishing the discussion like, um, yeah, we'll stay in touch, please let us know how it goes forward and so on. How do, would you interpret it, uh, this, yeah, this kind of approach? So that's, that's a really good question and it's, a, it's kind of a case by case thing and it depends on the quality of the VC and it depends on if you had a prior relationship with them before and some other things like that. Um, in general though, I would say that a lot of entrepreneurs can get massively distracted too early in the process by chasing money when that's not necessarily what they should be focused on. What they should be focused on is gaining traction. Um, you only, the thing is, is VCs, even if they're nice people, like it's, they're sneaky, right? Like, they, 
Um, you want to have the power in the relationship when you walk in and meet a VC. And what I mean by have power is you want to have market power where you have lots of VCs that see the opportunity and they want to put money into your startup. So if you're meeting with just, just one off with one VC who contacts you when you're not necessarily in fundraising mode, that's not necessarily going to be the best thing for the startup. So a good response could be, um, oh, hey, thank you, John. Um, really flattered that you've seen what we're doing and that you're interested. Um, we're not in fundraising mode right now, but and we're solely focused on building traction. In two months, can I please follow up with you and we can have a coffee at that point and I can show you our numbers. Um, I think any VC worth their salt will respect that kind of an answer. And, um, and, and yeah, the same goes uh, for so corporate, corporate development. So guys that work in internal M&A for like big tech companies are constantly trolling startups and saying, you know, oh, well, you know, I'm the corporate development guy for Cisco or for Google, and your startup looks really interesting. Should we, should we have coffee? And first of all, if, if you've had any VCs who have invested you in you previously, they're not going to be happy if you take that meeting because it means you're doing an exit for lower than the like, market value that the VC expected of you when, <laughs> when they invested in you. But secondly, it's just going to be distracting, and oftentimes it's, those types of decisions are taken at the CEO level. Like when the deal is actually done, it's not done by some like associate who's working in the M&A department internally. So don't be distracted by like yeah, VCs and, um, and internal M&A stuff. So at seed level, when you're uh, going out to prove, uh, prove or validate points uh, in your business plan, what do you need prepared to take to a, a VC? So you may not be showing, you know, 7% customer growth week over week at that point. In fact, you're probably not. But you can show, first of all, some kind of customer interest. And you can show your hypotheses that you want to validate. And you can show your assumptions as to why you believe those hypotheses to be true. Um, you can then show, if the, if the VC gives you 50,000 euros or something, you can show exactly how you'll spend that money to validate or invalidate the hypotheses that you currently have. Um, that's, that's the best way to do like a seed type financing. Oftentimes also with seed or angel money, if, I mean, angel money is kind of a separate discussion than VCs, but angels often really just invest kind of, you know, you seem like a nice guy, this sounds like an interesting product, and, you know, maybe... Maybe that angel like used to work in that particular vertical, so they know it a little bit better than others, and they're just it's kind of just a more personal relationship thing at that stage. It's not even as scientific as validating hypotheses. So anybody else? Cool, we'll we'll be around. We've got like wine and chips ahoy over there <laughs> for anybody that wants. Um, thanks again for coming out and uh, talk to you soon. <laughs>